There's a very important meeting that takes place in Kazan, Russia, on the 22nd of October. It is the summit meeting of BRICS. And at that meeting, it is thought that a series of very important decisions will be made. Everything from exchange rates, to investment, to currencies, and so on, that if that those decisions were taken, then it would be an attack, as it were, on America and her allies' fiat system. In other words, if allowed to mature, it would place America's hegemony on full alert. I am pretty sure that uh, currency will be on the agenda. I think the path will be laid out as to where they are going, which will be based on 40% of the, the asset behind the new currency, based on 40% gold, 60% on member countries' currencies. But those in turn will be linked into gold. So gold comes back into the monetary, into the BRICS monetary system. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the EdJR Mining Guy on X and of course the host of this channel. And I'm really looking forward to welcoming back Simon Hunt. He's the CEO, founder and uh, brain behind Simon Hunt Strategies our strategic services, sorry. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion because it's going to be a lot on geopolitics and uh, he's an absolute expert in that field. So I'm really looking forward to catching up with him. Last we had him on the channel was about three, three and a half months ago and a lot has happened. Um, I've, I've narrowed down four topics or circled four topics that I want to touch uh, touch on with him. Um, we're going to start geopolitics in general. What is happening in the world right now? I'm really curious what the latest developments in the Middle East are and how this is going to develop. Uh, but also also, we have a China stimulus package that was announced uh, about a week ago now. Uh, impact has been massive, especially on commodities, and I'm curious how that is impacting the rest. Um, we have a, a BRICS meeting coming up in October, so really want to discuss his, his his views on what might be discussed there. Petro Yuan is that big topic I want to highlight here. And of course, we'll talk Fed rate cuts and the, the, the strike of the U.S. longshoremen on the East Coast and potential shutting down of their local uh, the East Coast harbors and to whether the panic... Uh, I've seen this morning on social media is warranted. Should we be hoarding toilet paper again in uh, in fear of uh, potential supply chain issues uh, in the US again? So lo lots to discuss. Please hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoy the topics. If you like the discussion, it helps us out tremendously. Thanks for that. Now, Simon, it is great to see you again. And I'm really looking forward to catching up. Thanks for making the time. Well, thank you for having me once again. Always love our the, chats. Despite the comments <laughs> I made last time. Oh, despite what, what what comments, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. But no, Simon, like I mentioned in the intro, we have lots to catch up on, and I really want to make use of our time together. Let, let, let's dive right in. And uh, before hitting the record button, you suggest that we should start with geopolitics. Like, I, I've thrown out a lot of topics, but you say geopolitics is dominating pretty much everything that we're going to touch on. Let, let's start there. Um, geopolitics, how, how is it looking in the world, and what should we be focused on? Well, I think it's the fundamental question that needs to be answered in order to see where financial markets are going to proceed. The general view is that uh, we have big stimulus in, in America, we have big stimulus in, in China, <clears throat> and therefore it's back to risk on and markets are going to soar upwards and base metals as well and precious metals obviously the point that i like <coughs> i like to make is that the world is sitting at a very important pivotable point it really goes back to at least 1991 if not 1946 when America decided it wanted to dismember Russia to gain control of its huge natural resources. The 
uprising in Ukraine, which was engineered by Washington in 2014, led to NATO training the largest army in Europe of Ukrainians, some 450,000, armed and equipment by NATO, and built these massive um, fortifications around Donbass and uh, Donetsk. Putin was forced to come into Ukraine in order to support the Russian people living in the Donbass region because there was clear evidence that NATO, uh, through the Ukrainian army, was about to launch a massive attack on the Donbass region. That's history, but it leads up to where we are today because it's very clear that the war in Ukraine is being lost to NATO and Ukraine. And the attention is increasingly focusing on attacking Russia itself. And from all the information that we piece together, NATO's planned attacks probably started sometime in the second half of 2023, which led into a meeting that NATO held in a Baltic country in early May this year, where NATO told NATO governments to expect a war against Russia that NATO would be undertaking. So what we've seen in recent weeks has been a series of attacks on Russia. First of all, there is the incursion or invasion that Ukraine made into the cursed oblast region of Russia. Second, there have been continuous attacks on Russian infrastructure, particularly oil refineries, and also drone attacks on cities across Russia. The final attack was a missile attack on a military depot at Toropets. There are informed rumors that the attack was launched from a Baltic country where NATO exercises were taking place and rumors that it was uh, the attack was done by a British um, missile. So you have to think, is Putin going to retaliate or is he going to continue to absorb the punches which NATO has been throwing at him? I think it is highly likely that a war will break out. First, I think that Putin's retaliation will start with a massive miss missile, probably hypersonic missile, being launched across Ukraine. There's a very important meeting that takes place in Kazan, Russia, on the 22nd of October. It is the summit meeting of BRICS. And at that meeting, it is thought that a series of very important decisions will be made, everything from exchange rates to investment to currencies and so on, that if that, those decisions were taken, then it would be an attack, as it were, on America and her allies' fiat system. In other words, if allowed to mature, it would place America's hegemony on full alert. So I think there is a real risk that in Europe that some form of war will begin, if not before October, 
by the end of this year. And my sense, my guess would be, it will be before the BRICS summit meeting. The next part of the war scenario that we need to pay particular attention to is my region, the Middle East, as I live in Dubai. The assassination of Hassan Nasrullah, the Hezbollah leader, is a real game changer, not just for the region, but globally. Nasrullah was perceived within the Muslim community, global community, as a symbol, as a symbol of change in how the world operates. He was also the spiritual and military leader of Hezbollah. There have been, since that assassination, which included a large number of Hezbollah commanders, there's been great jubilation in Syria and in some Western capitals. Hezbollah has been defeated. We can install a puppet government in Beirut. We can take the war now into Iraq. We can regather the lands that we have lost and that we can bring back the 60 to 80,000 Israelis who had to be relocated from the northern borders. There are several problems with this consensus view. The first is that Hezbollah had developed a command structure so that when a commander or commanders were killed, that the replace, their replacements had already been trained. So what's going on now is that Hezbollah is discussing how the penetration occurred and what their actions are going to be. I come back onto that in a minute, but we now need to look and see what Iran might do now that their friend Nasrullah has been assassinated. People don't appreciate that the relationship, the close relationship between Iran and Lebanon goes back to the 16th century. So the relationship between Tehran and Hezbollah is not a one-way relationship, it's a two-way relationship. So what's happened in Tehran is that the new president was trying to send olive branches to the West. And the West responded by saying, we guarantee that there will be a ceasefire in Gaza and so on and so forth. Now the new president has admitted, quotes, I have been lied to. So all the uh, reticence of Iran to retaliate against the killing of the Hamas leader in Tehran has now been buried. When and how Iran retaliates will be determined not only by what happens between Israel and Lebanon, but how his retaliation will fit in with what Putin is planning, because conversations between the two leaders are on a regular basis. So our own take is that a full-scale war between Israel and Lebanon has begun. Don't underestimate the ability of Hezbollah to launch cruise and ballistic missiles that can hit anywhere in Israel. Don't ignore the risk 
that at the appropriate moment, Iran will also come into assisting Hezbollah and should, which seems likely, that Israel will take the war against Hezbollah into Syria, then that will automatically bring in um, Iran and Russia. When, can all, when may all this happen? I suspect that the clash between NATO and Russia will escalate, as I mentioned before, either before the end of this month or before the end of the year. I suspect that in Lebanon, we may get a pause. The pause could last until March, April next year with ongoing tit for tat uh, between Israel and Hezbollah. But by the middle of next year, we should see, we are likely to see a major conflict unfold. This is why I wanted to focus on the geopolitical side before looking at financial markets, space metal markets, etc. Because this is, in reality, these are the dominating themes that are going to influence everything. Very good overview, Simon. You've, you've noticed I didn't interrupt you. And let, let you speak for like 15 minutes. And it was really, really like insightful because I've taken like three pages of notes. And I'm trying to like have some smart follow-up questions, of course. Um, and, and I've written down two, um, which makes sense maybe to elaborate on one. Can Russia even afford a two front war at this point? And maybe as a second part, I know it's probably going to be an elaborate one. What role does the U.S. elections play in all of this? <laughs> two very good questions. Can Russia afford a two front war? I could turn it around. Can NATO afford a two front war? Uh, note that um, Putin has just called up reservists. So when they've all been called up, they will have an operating army of 2.3 million troops. How many does America have? I've forgotten the number. Under 500,000, I think. Something like that. Um, 452,689. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but more importantly, Iran can take care of itself. It's been taken 20 years to prepare for an attack. Its missile launches are deeply embedded in the mountains across the country. They will, on the first attack, they will mine the Hormoz Straits with explosives. So they are well prepared. So Russia's uh, part of Iran's war will be a continuous supply, if needed, if needed, of uh, equipment. What we know is that Russia has been sending by plane and ship and train very sophisticated electronic equipment and probably uh, other forms, such as missiles. So, effectively, Russia will be fighting on one front. They have troops in Syria. They may send additional troops. But again, I think it's very likely that Hezbollah is fully prepared and can take care of themselves. Uh, what you also see is that Syrian and Iraqi troops and paramilitary troops, numbering some 40,000, are close to the Israelis' borders, waiting for the go-ahead by Hezbollah to invade. So to answer your question, uh, Russia can afford a war on two fronts. The second question is probably more important, which is, where does this fit into the American elections? The first point we need to make is that 
the powers behind the White House throne do not want to see Trump getting into the White House. For them, he is an outsider and he will try to destroy everything that the powers behind the throne have created for so many years, which has basically been the dismembering of Russia, the control of China's economy, and the use of Israel as their bridgehead into the Middle East. So if Trump was in, and if RFK became Attorney General, all of these guys would be out on the streets. And so the bottom line is they are going to do whatever it takes to stop Trump from getting into the White House. Does that mean war? Maybe. Does it mean another attempt on Trump's life? Maybe. But I think that from what I piece together from my friends, whoever is in the White House in January, there will be the equivalent of serious civil strife across the country because the winning party, the losing party, will not accept the winning party. So this again goes back to, comes back to monetary and fiscal policy. Where are markets going? It's a very good question. <laughs> the losing, like, I'm not even sure how to bridge the topics now because there, there's a lot to discuss and unfold still because right now it doesn't seem like the US has a president. Like, and that's just my observation because I haven't heard from the sitting president in almost a couple of months now since uh, pretty much since he stepped down and said, I'm not going to get reelected. He completely disappeared. So is the US even functioning right now? Well, was it I, ever I think we all know that I think we all know the answer it, to that, by the way. But yeah, uh, was it ever functioning when Biden did appear from time to time? Yeah. The answer is very, very simple. Um, whoever is the Democrat president is basically told what to do by the money bags behind no. the powers, behind the throne. So, I mean, if Harris is there, she's just a mouth speak for the powers behind the throne. And that's what why if Trump gets in, he's an outsider, not part of the game. And that's what they fear. No, absolutely. Simon, you've touched on so many great topics, but I want to get a little bit more granular on, on China. You brought it up, the Chinese economy, but also like the petrol you want um, and, and how that fits. And I know it's like the BRICS meeting is going to be huge, but we've been, for lack of a better term, duped uh, before when we talked about a new currency installment by the BRICS last year when, when they met in Johannesburg last August. The market expectations were fairly high. And I just want to make sure and maybe triple check the facts this time that uh, when the BRICS meet that there are currency discussions on the table. Is that a fact? Is that, uh, is that going to happen? I, I am pretty sure that um, currency will be on the agenda. I think the path will be laid out as to where they are going, which will be based on 40% of that the asset behind the new currency will be based on 40% gold, 60% on member countries' currencies. But those in turn will be linked into gold. So gold comes back into the monetary, into the BRICS monetary system. What, was, what may well come out of the BRICS summit meeting is not a new currency, but a path towards the new currency. Because anything that BRICS puts forward has to have a unanimous agreement between all the member countries. And there are probably some difficulties with some member countries that need to be ironed out. So my guess is that what emerges is the path to that new currency, but not 
the announcement that this is our new currency. I think you're hinting at India there, that India maybe needs some reeling in. Yeah. Is it is it India that's sort of blocking? Well, I, I'm not, because I think I'm China not. and India are clashing a little bit in terms of philosophy. Uh, I think I suspect that the clashes. Let me answer the question a different way. I think India is now 100% with BRICS. I think they are trying to use the historical we bridge both worlds and trying to keep a leg into the American camp. Whether they succeed in that is a different matter. Certainly, America is using all of its tricks in its box to prevent India going 100% with BRICS. So there are lots of technical problems that, so I hear, need to be resolved before you actually can physically say, tomorrow we are going to launch our new currency. But the path will be laid out clearly. And that may well, to your second question, may well mean the Petro one. I mean, if you look at how um, large, how much trade China is conducting in its own currency, it's now, I think, from memory, over 50%, if not higher. Virtually all of their trade with Russia is in their own currencies. But if one country like Russia has a surplus over China, which it does at the moment, the balance is held in gold in the PBOC. That's another way that gold comes back into the system. And that will probably also be part of the BRICS new currency, which will be called the unit. Okay. So I'm not sure that we know that small parcels um, of oil and gas sold out of Saudi and the rest of the Middle East, UAE, are being conducted with gold. But I don't think that those two countries are yet ready to launch the complete Petro One currency. It's coming. It's, you know, again, I think the path will be laid out, but we're not there yet. Maybe as a follow up, I was just looking like Chinese uh, or the Chinese one shares in global payments hit a record high now just in July. Uh, it's about 5%, 4.8% roughly of global finance or payments are being made in yuan. It's growing. I think in 2010, it was 0.6%. So it, it's almost up, gone up, was it eight, nine, ten fold? Uh, depends on the metric you want to use here. But is, is that 4.8% 4, 4, 4. still too low to be relevant? Or is that something, an uh, accelerating trend? I, I think it all depends on how you define it. Um, outside SWIFT, it's 70, 80%. And again, SWIFT, is part of the US control system. So once BRICS gets its act together, that system is going to come under severe pressure. But you posed a question on China. Yes, it's a big stimulus. Um, it's got markets on fire. Uh, what is going to be the impact on China's economy? Very little this year. And my friends say it will probably add 0.5% to growth next year. My own take is that the primary purpose of this stimulus program is taking preemptive measures because China's leadership understands that war somewhere is going to break out. And therefore, war would have a huge impact on China's economy. Thus, the leadership is putting in place measures to support 
that eventuality. Interesting point, because last time we talked, or maybe two times ago, like a couple times ago, we spoke and China is very closely linked to Iran, you mentioned before. And uh, sure. Sure. If, if Iran gets pulled into the whole conflict in the Middle East, and I haven't heard you mention China in that context, like has their role changed? It seems like they've gotten a little more no. passive. I'm curious, like just yeah, based that, on that, headlines. That, 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 that's China's way. Its diplomacy is passive. It doesn't want to lead war. But if Iran is attacked, they will support Iran. If there is an official, if there is a not a de facto NATO war against Russia, but a real war against Russia, China will support Russia. Since we're on the topic of China, Taiwan, like it, it's gotten a bit quiet. The sable rattling has got a little more quiet in, in recent months here as, as well. Do you see an escalation happening? Like, is that still on the docket? And like, what should we be paying attention to here? I think the the um, difficulties that China would face on invading Taiwan are immense. Not least the sea terrain around Taiwan, which makes it extremely difficult or any invasion. If China was going to do anything, it would be a blockade. You stop stuff going into Taiwan, soon Taiwan would be on its knees. Uh, but I think for the moment, as you said, um, Taiwan is on the back burner. We're, we're, like I'm, I'm always trying to have a bit of a light tone because we're, ha we're having heavy discussions here, but like, where's the eye of Sauron pointing now then for China? Like, if you understand, like from, from Lord of the Rings, the Eye of Sauron is the bad eye. Like, where, where is it looking? Where is it focused right now? Is it mo mostly internal and making sure it's stabilizing the economy, maybe boosting it? Is that a distraction almost? Oh, uh, I think that, I mean, first of all, China will know pretty precisely what's going on in the world. And therefore, my take is they they are pretty aware that a war is round the corner and therefore they are preparing their economy for that eventuality that makes sense then all the, all the stimulus because a lot is going into infrastructure um of course as well is, is it even yeah. enough do you have an opinion on that like is china stimulating enough depends what you mean by enough what do they want to do basically they just want to stabilize the economy at these levels rather than to stimulate it. I mean, you can see from all the data that since mid-year, business has fallen very sharply, which from my friends on the ground, I can confirm. So what what is being done is stabilization, not stimuli, stimulating. Your forecast of 0.5% GDP growth is pretty much that. It's stimulating. It's not stimulating. It's stabilizing. It's not stabilizing. massive growth. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that sort of fits that bill. Um, talking about stimulating, and I'm trying to fit a lot of topics into this conversation here, but we do need to talk about the U.S. and the U.S. economy, um, how, how that fits in, or if that's just a secondary item on the agenda, on the global agenda. But uh, we do need to talk about the, the Fed rate cut and how it is impacting things. And uh, maybe more short-term focused is also, like I mentioned in my intro, just last night we got information that the U.S. Uh, East Coast uh, longshoremen are going on strike. And it, based on what I've been reading, it's causing panic on social media. And uh, people are asking or wondering if they should stockpile goods again. Um, do, do you have a view on that? Like, And how does that sort of fit into the overall role? Yeah, like, I, I, It's, I it's an interesting like mi micro discussion, but that could escalate to a macro discussion. Uh, there's no question about that. Why did the Fed cut rates by 50 basis points? What do they see coming down the credit pike that we, that we are not aware of? And I think, that, I think that they know that there are some nasties coming down that would disrupt everything. So the other point, of course, is that uh, you can see that employment is starting to fall sharply. The numbers that the BLS produce 
are almost dreamlike numbers as they emanate largely from their birth death death model, which is a guess on to what companies are doing. Whereas corporate CEOs know the name of the game very clearly, and they are letting staff go, cutting costs is their primary objective. So I, I think if, if, if and, and then again, if you, um, all retail sales are quoted in nominal terms, but if you deflate them by, even by the CPI, which understates real inflation, retail sales are negative. Then if you look at GDP and GDI are supposed to produce the same result, but since the first quarter of 2023 to the second quarter of 2024, GDP rose by 2.7%, GDI by 0 0.7, which is the better which is the the, the 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 best way of showing you what the economy is doing when you look at what's happening to employment what's happening to real retail sales and private investment the gdi number is the more accurate one but of course it's never quoted so i mean i i think uh, the american economy if it's not in recession is on the verge of recession and will be in recession by the end of this year. Where's that going to leave <coughs> financial markets? Um, I think with some volatility, you're going to see markets uh, continue to grow sharply into the early months of next year. Then they will meet the headwinds of the results of the American elections. Of course, all bets are off if war develops by the end of this year, either in the Middle East or in Europe. So really, it's an extremely volatile um, groundwork for equity and base metal markets. I have a follow-up question. Like when you were last on about three, three and a half months ago, you expected the market to correct sharply by the end of the year. Like you've pushed it back now to Q1, maybe in, in mid mid H1 next year. I'm just curious, what is the reason for for the delay? Like, what what is the impact? Like, what is something that we forgot to maybe take into consideration? The burst of global liquidity. It's liquidity that drives markets, and that's what's been happening. And that's I've seen a stat from uh, our good friend, uh, Michael, I forgot his last name, Cross Border Capital, um, doing a fantastic analysis on that. And I just saw his chart, I think it was earlier this week, where he showed a, a chart of the implosion of liquidity globally. I, I need to follow up. Michael Howell, that's who he was. Um, I need to follow up with Michael and, and see what that what the impact there is, because massive stimulus globally, as you said, China, although it's like US hasn't announced a stimulus package, but it's indirect. Do you do you consider the Fed rate cut and potential loosening of QT as, as stimulus? Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Uh, but is it going to be enough when all of these headwinds come? I don't think so. I think the Fed's stimulus and rate cuts is like China a preemptive move. I have one last topic, Simon. I want to use the last five minutes just for that before we get too long here, because I always enjoy talking with you. But you, you once mentioned, and I, I think I quote you quite often, is actually you said the bond market is the root of all evil, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I? Think you said, I think you said that in one of the interviews, and I keep quoting it from time to time because the bond market is a massive behemoth. I don't even know the total size of it. It's, it's just ginormous, the U.S. Yeah. bond market. But yeah. one question maybe that ties it all together, the BRICS meeting at the end of this month, does it have a... Is, is there a chance that it could topple the bond markets by China maybe saying we're selling all our bonds? And I don't want to put anything in your mouth here, but I'm just curious because it, it is such a big financial market. And uh, if, if something were to happen, it would come through the bond market, would you think? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't think that China will come up with any statement like that. Um, it would only, that would only happen if they were physically attacked. I think 
it's the bond market is going to follow the profile of inflation. So short term, US CPI and global inflation is falling, but it's short term. And by the middle of next year, CPI and global inflation will be starting to rise. And that's when the bond market will turn around. So we can well see US 10 year treasuries yielding 3% by the end of the year, early next year, and then that will be the bottom. And as inflation, as we see a replete of what we experienced in the late 1970s and early 1980s, we will see US CPI in double digit figures, and we see US 10 year treasuries yielding in double digit figures also. And what what will that do to a highly indebted global system? That, that's the next big question, because one of the rumors is that Fed Powell, uh, Chairman Powell lowered interest rates so the US could actually cover their debt covenants and can actually pay and issue lower costing bonds. Like, as, as, as you said, 10 years at 3.75 right now, and uh, they need to refinance. I think 2025 is a big year financially They need where they yeah, really need to refinance yeah. a lot of the outstanding bills and bonds. So, yeah, no, but, fantastic. You know, <laughs> hmm? go, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, it's the cycle. All comes back to the cycle. It comes back to the inflation cycle. And, and lower interest rates are, are supposed to stimulate that inflation cycle. And then the, the, the strike potentially uh, of the longshoremen, we haven't talked about that part yet, but uh, the strike- As bound, costs, to, bound, bound to, prices of everything will rise. Will have massive impacts there. Comes back to your toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to be funny, but uh, I, I've read a comment about that on X somewhere that uh, should we go hoard again? I was like, I, I wouldn't go that far yet, but uh, it is it is an no, I, topic. I, I think I, I think that the world is entering such a dangerous period that people should ensure that they have a lot of food supplies on hand. And the way to survive is to make sure that some of your assets are in gold physical gold, not ETFs. No, I fully agree. You have to think forward a little bit. And uh, yep. So, yep. We, the writing is on the wall to a degree. We all hope, of yep. course, it doesn't play out the, the way we describe it and yep. look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got, uh, to have a, you've got to have a contingency plan. Yeah, absolutely. Simon, wonderful discussion. Really enjoyed every time. It's like I took four or five pages of notes as well while you were talking. It's, uh, it's wonderful. It'll probably last me for the next four weeks and just go through it and use, use some of the material you've provided uh, in, in other interviews and conversations as well. It's really, really in-depth because it really fits together with a lot of things I'm seeing as well. And I'm, I'm curious, quick question. Do you follow Johnny Harris? Do you know him, of him? No, no I okay, don't. Now he's somebody on social media I follow who does phenomenal geopolitical journalism. And uh, he, I saw a, a reel and a, and a bit of a documentary about Djibouti and how Iran is trying to reestablishing a base um, and the Strait of Hormuz that it didn't have or it didn't have for years. So ties all in, like, which is really interesting. So, so if anybody wants to contact me, it's at, what is it, simon-hunt.com. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, you have a newsletter uh, there as well. So I highly yeah, yeah. urge people to, to subscribe to it and to fo you. follow follow you. Simon, thank you so much for your time. I really, really yeah, appreciate yeah. it. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found this as informational as I did. As I said, I took a lot of notes. I hope you've done so as well. There's lots going on, and it's sometimes really, really good to zoom out. Um, you might have noticed I keep staying focused too much on uh, micro topics almost in, 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 in that regard. Like talking about the Fed rate cuts, they're all parts of the whole ecosystem, but it's good to zoom out from time to time. What is happening on a global scale and how does it impact the decision making on a micro level? That's what we're trying to do. And it's been hugely educational having Simon on. If you think so as well, please hit that like and subscribe button, follow us. And uh, we really want to hear from you as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially. Thank you.